Nerd Night, The Medium Place, Big Data and Ethics. I am Ben. I am a grad student at the University of Michigan, uh, and I do material science engineering. And so generally, I'm applying uh, big data type stuff to particles, and there aren't that many ethical considerations. Uh, but when you apply it to human beings, there can be some weird ethical things that come up, and it's important to talk about them to understand when big data and algorithms border on these ethical topics and how do we deal with them. So these terms, big data and ethics, pretty big terms, people have heard them a lot, so it's important to talk about what exactly we mean when we're talking about these topics. So we should talk about what is ethics in this case. So ethics are specifically the expected norm, well, interesting, okay. Ethics are the expected norms of people within society, right? So it comes up from a society agreeing on what those ethics are. So it's not just one person deciding what ethics is, it's all of us in this room, basically. The thing that individuals decide is their individual morals. Oh, so that shows up much better. Okay. Uh, morals are your personal values or beliefs, and those in aggregate make up your ethics. And those ethical considerations may or may not be encoded in things called laws which governments enforce and enforce different regulations of behaviors in general. So a more concrete example of all this happening is say this crosswalk here. So if we look at this crosswalk, there aren't many, many people respecting maybe the laws of what crosswalks are supposed to do. Uh, you have people basically going about as they like and cars going in and sort of going slow enough that people can move around them, right? So here, this sort of behavior is what, it, this is the ethics of the consideration, of the situation, where people can move about as they please and cars move slowly enough to go around them. Uh, it might not be encoded in law, might not be encoded in like your morals as a responsible driver, as what a responsible driver should do. Um, it's definitely unethical in this situation to drive your car speeding through this intersection and knocking people over, right? That is not what the ethical uh, conduct is in this situation. Right, so it's the aggregate of all these people together agreeing on what the ethics are. So big data, people have probably heard more about this. It's the large amounts of data that's collected by different organizations or companies to make predictions about what, what is important to them. So whether it's not how consumers behave or about uh, what posts will get the most likes on say Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. <laughs> Um, what sort of stocks to buy depending on different factors at different companies that maybe Goldman Sachs or E-Trade or TD Ameritrade cares about, uh, what kinds of factors influence a viral video, say on YouTube, or what kind of things people buy when they look at other things on, say, Amazon, right? So it's these institutions collecting data about the people who use their services or are involved in their decision-making and using that data in aggregate to make decisions about what comes next. So for a more concrete example, uh, if we look at, say, uh, my personal Google history here, uh, we see that I was preparing for this talk. So I was looking at online advertising and targeted advertising. I was looking for the definition of morals and the definition of laws for a previous slide. Um, I was also looking up some things about lithium oxide stuff for material science. Um, and all this stuff, uh, in aggregate together, when I look for the term model, the next thing it wants to complete is scientific definition, which may or may not be what you look at when you go on Google and look for model. Uh, <laughs> you might come up with a more classical definition they provide on the side of, say, a person who is modeling, say, clothing. Or uh, you might think of the uh, new Tesla model that Google thinks that I should be interested in uh, because grad students make enough money to buy Teslas apparently. But, uh, or you might be looking for the actual definition considering I was looking at definitions for other things, right? So Google is making these predictions about what I want based on what kind of history I've provided it and what kind of things other people like me have provided Google. So obviously big data is useful. Like we like it that Google gives us relevant results. Um, but there can be some ethical quandaries that come up from the big data algorithms that result. Um, there can be certain controversies, such as uh, the Strava controversy in uh, 2018, 
where Strava is a running app and it allows users to upload their routes to uh, the app so that way other people can look at their routes and see if they want to run them. Um, but it's a bit of a problem if, say, you're stationed in Afghanistan and you like running because you're a fit person and you're on a secret base and so there's nothing on Google Maps that's supposed to be around there, but all of a sudden there's a bunch of Strava routes of people who are really active in this area that there's not supposed to be anything in. So that sort of reveals your secret base location uh, and is sort of not what you're going for if you're a government entity. <laughs> Uh, there can be issues if, say, algorithms are trained to try and pick out which resumes yield good candidates. If the people who already are in those jobs are, say, uh, already male-dominated. So uh, because, uh, because uh, these algorithms are trained on essentially biased data of primarily men's resumes, they start to discount uh, activities that say women's in them. And so that's obviously a problem because they don't want to train a sexist robot. Uh, so there can lead to some controversies when you're not careful about how you treat the algorithm. So in this talk, we're going to talk about do, do big data algorithms have ethics in the first place? And if so, how do they get them in there? Uh, and we're going to approach this from looking at how these algorithms work mechanically and then an in-depth use case with uh, what's called the compass recidivism algorithm. And we'll go through what that means as we go through. So first, how do ethical values get into big data prediction? So we should talk about how you would predict from uh, data or big data. And there's generally two phases. There's what's called the training phase and the testing phase. So when you train first, uh, you're going to look at uh, your observations to try to extract evidence from them. And your algorithm can be thought of as like your like, little baby that you are uh, trying to work on and prove always. So in this example, we're going to talk about a baby. Uh, this baby has encountered a new thing called dog. It has learned that this thing is called dog. And it looks at it and says, all right, what is some useful evidence I can extract from dog? All right, dog is furry. Dog has two ears, two eyes, a nose, four legs, and a tail. Those are all things I know about dog. And so make a model, make a mental model of it. So if four legs, tail, fluffy, etc., it must be dog. And so then you need to test your algorithm. So we're going to test baby. Baby is going to encounter a never-before-seen thing, and it's going to extract the use useful evidence here, and it sees that it has all of the features that it knows to constitute dog, and so it's going to apply the mental model and come up with dog. And so we, as the trainers of the baby algorithm, say, yes, you got it right, baby, you go. <laughs> but you can imagine... What could go wrong, right? It's not like there are other things that have four legs, tails, and are furry, like uh, cats. And so you observe your thing, you extract the evidence, you apply your mental model, you say dog confidently, and then you have to tell baby no. No, baby. That is incorrect. That is something called cat that you didn't know until right now. All right, and so then baby has to update its mental model. So maybe now it has to say a long snout, it's what's required for it to be a dog, or maybe more floppy ears. And if not, then it's something called cat, right? So it was important for baby to not only uh, be trained on dog, but also be trained on things that are not dog, right? And to uh, also get that feedback for when it's incorrect, right? And so all of this is, can be summed up in this uh, cartoon here where we have these two programmers who are trying to train a machine learning system and the person says, yeah, you pour the data into this big thing and there's a bunch of math and you stir around the math and when the answers start looking right, it means you did it right. <laughs> so the important things are that you fed in data and that you saw answers that looked right, right? And so in both of these cases, you can have ethics crop up in your system. What kind of things you feed into the system to train on and how you define looking right, how the feedback that you supply to the algorithm actually turns into the final product. So to make this a bit more concrete, we're gonna talk about this uh, case study of the compass recidivism algorithm, right? So in this thing, they're trying to train an algorithm to deal with in, uh, incarceration rates. So uh, in the United States, we happen to incarcerate a lot of people, uh, more so than other countries. Uh, the, Reasons for that are many and varied and should be another nerd night talk that people talk about. Um, but there's a lot of money spent on 
dealing with uh, these amount of convicted people, and so there's a lot of pressure to optimize this system, right? So you can imagine uh, you would want to create an algorithm that's able to deal with these kinds of things. So Compass is an algorithm built by a company called North Point, later named Equivant. Uh, it is a company that seeks to make software uh, for law enforcement, insurance companies, people who want to deal with the criminal justice system in some way. And their definition of recidivism that they're going to train their algorithm for is, will a convicted offender uh, be uh, com or commit a crime again within two years of release, right? Whether they will go back into the system after being released. So that's their intended goal. And before we talk about how they went about uh, training that algorithm and dealing with the data, let's first figure out what we consider ethical decision making in this inst instance. Specifically, how would you complete should blank influence the severity of punishment for a crime? And so I'm gonna go through uh, some different options here. And as a bit little disclaimer, I don't want you to necessarily raise your hand or nod. I want you to think about the implications for using this kind of data to answer this kind of question. And think about, more importantly, uh, not whether a factor can predict criminality, but whether it should be used, right? Is it ethical to include this kind of data to answer this kind of question? So all that being said, uh, should a person's personal criminal history be factored into a crime, or factored into punishment for a crime? How often they have committed a similar crime? How often do they commit crimes in general? Uh, if they're a first-time offender, et cetera. Uh, the criminal history of their family, if they have relatives who have committed crimes in the past. Their family history in general, whether they have parents who are together or separated, how many siblings they have, uh, if their siblings have a job or not, how well off their siblings are, uh, how well off they are, their personal finances, if they are uh, middle class, uh, if they are just getting enough to get by, if they are gobs and gobs of money. Uh, gender, race, or mental health. All right, so I hope you've taken some time to think about what you consider ethical conduct would be in terms of answering this kind of question. Uh, and with that, we'll talk about how the kinds of data Compass collects to make this decision. So again, Compass is simply trying to figure out if a convicted offender will commit a crime within two years of release. And to do that, they uh, collect data through this risk assessment, uh, which is done by the, uh, the arrested person and the arresting officer. So here we are taking into account gender. Uh, they're scaling by the location. Uh, it says, based on the screener's observations, is this person suspected or admitted gang member? So talking about personal criminal history. Uh, they're talking about family criminality, but it, inside that they say, if you lived with both parents and they later separated, how old were you at the time? Uh, we're talking about your friends. So how many of your friends or acquaintances have ever been arrested is a question. We have how often do you barely have enough money to get by? Uh, we have questions of, it says leisure and recreation, but these are things bordering on mental health in terms of how often do you feel bored? How often do you feel unhappy? Uh, how uh, do you feel discouraged? Right, so this is the kind of data that is being funneled into the compass recidivism algorithm to figure out if people are at low risk or high risk of committing a crime again within two years. So, there are some usage problems with how this Compass algorithm was used so, uh, and how it was evaluated as well. So the Compass evaluations were all done internally. Uh, also, the decision making from the surveys is a trade secret, it's proprietary. So both these things say that like this is used in a public space, but it is completely private, so it's hard to tell what exactly the algorithm is doing besides knowing the inputs and the outputs. Uh, and a, a citizen advocacy group, ProPublica, in 2016 did an analysis uh, uh, for use in Broward County on pretrial offenders um, and found some troubling racial differences where basically the algorithm was 
more likely to weight, uh, rate white offenders as being low risk for recidivism and was more likely to rate black offenders for being higher risk of recidivism. And a bit more troubling, when the algorithm was wrong, it was more likely to be wrong uh, and give a false positive for black people to assume that uh, black people were more likely to recidivate than they actually were, and the opposite for white offenders. So, so Compass and North Point and Equivant, they all had things to say about this because uh, it doesn't paint them in too kind of a light. Uh, they specified that the overall accuracy between black and white offenders in their system is similar. Uh, they say that 69%, 67% is accurate enough as they need to be. There's a bit of ethical consideration as whether or not you're okay with that amount of accuracy. That's a separate question. Uh, they countered that recidivism rates between white and black offenders already differ, so it is harder to uh, train on that sort of data. Uh, they say that Compass is only to be used for convicted offenders and not these pretrial cases. Um, ProPublica made this decision, though, to train on pretrial cases because uh, the Compass scores have been used to influence a judge's recommendation for severity of punishment or length of punishment or to influence someone's parole. Uh, so that was why they chose pretrial cases. Um, and moreover, an independent study found that under a different standard of fairness that the uh, study found little bias between white and black offenders. Uh, basically found that it was roughly similar between rating white and black offenders between low, medium, and high risk of recidivism under their uh, different analysis, basically. And so there are some issues in this Compass case, and I'm, I'm highlighting the Compass case not to necessarily have you throw tomatoes at North Point and Equivant and say that they are terrible, awful, and worthless, or to uh, say ProPublica was after a catchy headline and so they manipulated their data to get it. So I'm using this as a case to grab your attention and highlight certain issues that come up when you're dealing with these kinds of algorithms when dealing with people and important decisions. So specifically, uh, this is a case of misusing a model. Again, the fact that this these scores have been used to influence uh, how judges will assign punishment and how parole will be uh, given was not an intended use for this algorithm, uh, both from uh, North Point and Equivan's point of view and from their, the people who evaluated these, the independent agency and ProPublica. Uh, so this is a misuse of a model, and so it's not properly trained for that. Uh, it has some ethically questionable evidence, so uh, based on the risk assessment that we did earlier and maybe your personal feelings about what the ethics of society should be, uh, you could make the case for some of the evidence that was used to be questionable at the very least. Uh, there are also hidden mechanisms, so because uh, the uh, way the results are processed to get to the final output uh, is hidden, it is trade secret, proprietary, etc. Uh, it is difficult to troubleshoot uh, publicly to make sure that we agree that the decisions that this algorithm is making is in line with the way we want our criminal justice system to work. And there are some differing standards of fairness. Again, the independent uh, study used a different standard and said that there was no bias, whereas ProPublica said that there was bias. So you need to agree on what you consider the answers looking right to be, especially when you're dealing with sensitive information and have everyone agree on what those terms mean. And Compass uh, slash Equivant slash North Point uh, countered with this a bit, but there is a biased status quo sample where if we look at uh, the racial makeup of convicted offenders, there's overrepresentation of non-white people in, uh, in prison systems. And so if you try to train on already biased data, you can't be surprised when you get biased results. And an important consideration is like just because there is an algorithm that makes decisions and that uses math doesn't mean that we are absolved of dealing with personal biases and our value systems and our ethics in making sure those algorithms are doing what we want them to do. So what does all this mean? Uh, 
big data is a helpful tool. Again, like I like Google and I like Amazon and I like using those things to figure out what kind of products I should buy or what the useful definition of model should be for the thing I'm looking up. But any tool misunderstood or misused can be dangerous. And so it's important to make sure that people just like you and me understand how these algorithms operate and are used and how they can be misused. And hopefully that can better inform your decisions in the future. Uh, because at the end of the day, algorithms pick out patterns and it's up to us as human beings to assign value and meaning to those patterns. And that comes out of our overall ethics as a society and our individual morals. So if this was troubling to you at all, what can you do about it? So uh, you should consider the data that you provide to different companies and to different algorithms and consider the incentives or biases that might be present in those algorithms and those organizations. Uh, for example, there's a consideration in online discourse that the algorithms that try to optimize the amount of time you spend online also reinforces an echo chamber of voicing opinions that are similar to yours. That's something where an algorithm is meant to help you, but it's uh, using that data in a way that may or may not be ethical in that case, right? So if you don't agree with that, then opt out of the programs you don't support. Uh, and identify and call out things that are troubling to you. If they are collecting data that seems to be unethical, uh, don't use those algorithms if you can. Uh, and maybe vote with your dollar in that case, like don't support them, but also vote in general, because sometimes it is difficult to vote with your dollar when things provide so much value. Like, I like the things that Google, Amazon, Facebook, et cetera do, but some things are troubling and it's hard for me as an individual to opt out of those programs. And so it's up to us as a society to deter unethical conduct. Uh, and some resources to learn more, there's a good, uh, course on data science ethic, but ethics by Professor Jagadish at the university. All the lectures are available for free online, uh, and that inspired a lot of this talk, as well as the book Automating Inequality by Virginia Eubanks, who looks into how algorithms can reinforce existing inequality and poverty. Uh, and you can read into the recidivism algorithm that we highlighted, both uh, ProPublica's analysis and the independent review. Um, and you can look up uh, this 10 controversial data science uh, issues. There are new ones coming up all the time. Uh, and I hope this talk has made you more informed about how to deal with these kinds of issues in the future. Thank you. This program was recorded on August 15th, 2019 at Live, 102 South 1st Street.